to know. First of all, can you hear me? Am I coming through? Yes. And uh, this is a big privilege for me, actually, because I completely underestimated how long this organisation has been going for. <laughs> now, since 1802, is, um, I'm feeling really humbled to be actually included, looking at some of the people who have spoken. What I'm going to attempt to do today is really share a little bit of a story, just share a little bit of a journey. Um, and it's going to be general to say, you know, how can we collectively help any situation actually for individuals or collections of individuals to realise their potential. Now, that's the sort of general thing. So I can actually see a few mentors in the audience actually, so I think there's a few kind of faces that might know some of the stuff that I'll be talking about. But what I'm actually going to do is, is appeal a little bit more to you individually. Because I think it's not just about what I do in my job, I think it's more of a society comment. Because what I certainly can see is a lot of fragmentation, a lot of pulling apart a lot of those that have and those that don't, and actually a lot of chance that keeps driving it apart rather than bringing it together. So what I was quite keen to do today is share a little bit about, okay, what's my journey? That's not really going to be interesting to you, but what I learned along the way, because what I definitely want to, to share without a shadow of a doubt is I am world class at failure. I am absolutely not going to stand here to say, oh, it's a beautiful track record and everything has gone fabulously. I've got slides that say that, but I don't want to spend time on that. I want to spend time on actually what doesn't work, because that, maybe it's because I'm Glaswegian or Scottish, I don't know, but that's what I've learned the most, and that's what I'm trying to gather up as I go. So I'll give you a bit of the flowery version you know, of my so-called track record. You've heard and seen some of this. So I'm glad to I'll go very quickly through it, so I apologise, I've got a lot of data, I'll go quickly through it. Glass region, went to Stratford University actually, out of it, wanted to be a business person, first job, I went, 13th employee I think, in school rides, and I had an idea. And I had an idea, it was a very naive idea, but I just kept at it, and eventually that idea really worked for that organisation. And that organisation then went worldwide. Sounds a bit ridiculous, but that's just effectively what happened. It was sold two years ago for $250 million with exactly the same technology that we started. I first started in the kitchen. So, things can happen, and that did happen. That gave me a wee bit of financial choice. Sadly, I wasn't participating in the $250 million sale, it's not much to say, my goodness, that was great. It was sold way back. And I then started working with other investors who thought that they could back me to do the same thing again, but I'd already done that, I didn't want to do the same thing again. So I started working with them. Sadly, these investors, private equity, some of you may or may not know it, so they can be right on the edge of trying to make money. So I worked with them. It was, in the occasion, not working with the devil, but it was fabulous fun. But they would make investments and some of them would work. That's when they turned to me, because I got a wee bit of a reputation of being able to sort stuff out. Because I enjoyed it, actually. There's always a little bit of, of pleasure in doing things. And again, some of the Glaswegian trait, when people said it can't be done, or it's really broken, that's what really motivated me. I seem to get quite deep into my creative desires. So we did a few of those. Ones that you'll know, ones that you wouldn't know, from Hobbs, ladies' fashion, right through to sports nutrition, jet petrol stations, right to small stuff. Built up a reputation. At the same time, I was recycling a bit of ill-gotten gains into a foundation. And it was up here. Because we don't know, I live in London. So I go back and come up here, I work full-time in Glasgow. When I was up here, I worked full-time in London, but now I'm actually working full-time in Glasgow rather than London. How stupid am I in terms of travel agents? Um, so that was going swimmingly along. So that's, that's the sort of image of it. It's quite a number of cases. They all succeeded. That's the public perception. But if I bring you know, the reality of it, the reality of going into broken situations is not about numbers. It's absolutely not about brands or inanimate objects. It's about individuals. It's about teams of people. And what I learned along the way is that I was going to affect nothing until I really got to understand the teams of people. And I will come back to the transition, the last thing on my slide, um, of the transition into what is effectively what I'm now doing. And it was a business I was asked to sort out. I will touch on it later. It's quite a traumatic experience for me because it was care homes, children's homes, 
90 of them don't own five schools and a foster agency, and that's when I made the transition to effectively the third sector. Also, I'm not going to talk about private, public, and third sector. What I'm going to bring out is there's a huge amount of common denominators, a huge amount of things that are consistent. So that's the public, but the reality is I was always one step off failure, always one step off it. And the best story I've got to share, to share at this point, is nominated, sitting in the Savoy Hotel, nominated as a little Scottish boy, and with the great and the good on awards for best turnaround of the year and all this kind of stuff. I was up for two of the four, believe it or not. I had no idea, absolutely no idea. But at the same time as sitting in the Savoy, my phone is going off with a problem. And it's something I've signed up to do, and I've committed my name to it, and that meant you would go in as the boss, or you would go in as the, you know, you'd sign the forms as a director, so you know you're taking responsibility, you take financial responsibility. So I'm sitting there having far too much to drink, because it clearly was an enjoyable occasion, and I think it was great to be included. And the phone is going off telling me the organisation that I've just committed to do has found a problem, much better problem than I had anticipated. And how clever was I? And this was terminal potential. And this was literally 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. Now you can imagine what happened. I got two of the four awards. Whilst well, having had too much to drink, with the knowledge that this is about to go spectacularly wrong, sitting beside me was a table of journalists. So in my head, I'm going to be UK turnaround professional of the year and then trash the next day. Because unfortunately this company was oil and gas, but it was software that was running a lot of the oil and gas production. So don't get me wrong, I'm sure it would have shut the industry down, but it might have just missed a heartbeat for about 20 seconds or maybe 20 minutes. That's the reality of what we do as students. Whatever you read is not true. And it is a big point I try to make to young people that actually don't live two lives, don't live the virtual version of yourself with what the real is, because again, it keeps pulling apart. So what did I learn? Six or seven points is I'll pick out of what did I learn this means about sustainable change. First thing, and there's no question, not all talent reaches opportunity. Now this is my private sector experience so far. I'm going to come back to what I'm sitting in more working with young people. Now, it might have stated the obvious, but I'd ask you to reflect on it equally yourselves. So if I had a judgment when I went into an organisation that it was failing. I had a judgment with a young person that was failing to say it must be something to do with them. But go back to the organisations. What I found to my cost, because when you first go in to be the turnaround person, you're encouraged, you're incentivised, you're motivated to take people out, to take costs out, to change them, be seen to do stuff. These are the biggest mistakes I've made of judging something before you're actually going to get to know it. Now you can't spend ages getting to know it, but you've got to get to know it because there is no question the very best turnarounds I've been involved in and ultimately transformations have actually been in the main with exactly the same people that got into the situation in the first place. Exactly the same. Some of the dynamics were slightly different. So again, that's a real truism that I think we should all maybe reflect on because I'm fighting my unconscious bias, I'm fighting my judgment because it's just wrong. It's been wrong on so many occasions. Now, I'm going to definitely test your imagination here just to sort of emphasize the point, because I am there for those that want to have a look. Now, I'm giving an example of not all talent. Can you stop me? <laughs> no, I'm not the ginger person in the back row with the moustache. I'm necessarily the portly chap in the front row. Now, my original aspiration was actually to be football, but I'm not making the point of I should have made it, I should have been this, that, the next thing. But what I did learn at an early age, it was much better players than me. Much better. It didn't. It didn't make it. It didn't get there. I got there, that's Clyde, for those that don't know, that was one of the original Glasgow teams. Um, I did get my 30 quid a week whilst I was in university playing football, and it was dying to heaven stuff. It was fabulous. So just for those that can't spot me, <laughs> You're outraged by that <laughs> So, not all talent, just reflect on it. This is really important for me that I do hope you can come with me individually and look at and speak and speak into every individual. So, not all talent reaches potential. Another key lesson for me 
is we get exactly what we value. Now, when I say value, I actually mean values in a principal sense as well as values in a monetary sense. And this is a real risk that we face as a country, as organisations and individuals, because let me tell you from experience the way it works. If I am use the banking sector just as an example, if I we know what's happened to the banking sector, it was a disaster, absolute disaster. Huge sums of money been taken out of it, incentives, all the stuff that you know, banking bonuses. But let me give you a slightly different lens through which to look at it. But actually there was really good people in these banks that were as committed, as committed to customer service, to helping people out, to doing the right thing and living by the DNA of which they had been established. Absolute committed people, no question. Because what if I leave out all the values, the principles on the table, they would all be there. We want to have a livelihood, we want to support companies, we want to actually do the right thing, we want to help, we want to distribute capital to the right people and make sure we get a return for it for our shareholders. If I lay it all out, they'll all be there. Every organisation I've ever got into, they were always there. The difference is life doesn't work like that. Life works that you rank them. We always rank them. What's the most important one to what's the least important one? It's not what's discussed openly, but it's what is true. And it's what a culture becomes. And what happened in the banks is unfortunately the one that went to the top is make money. Individually make money. It didn't mean that the rest didn't exist. It just meant that they became second, third, fourth, fifth. They became subsidiary. But to give you another example of how dangerous this, this actually is, I could use any sector, I could use education, see? Let's really focus absolutely on attainment. Attainment only, this, 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 and drive that. Drive the stats, drive statistics, drive that. You then get behaviour that reflects it. Because you get exactly what you value. So again, a big cautionary thing for me is we need to just keep sense checking it. I went to work with private equity and it was amazing, absolutely amazing. Because they would have huge sums of money. And this is how ridiculous. I, I was actually, if I'm being, being honest, I was absolutely motivated by what they did. By making a buck of it. Because what happened is they were incentivized to spend. It didn't mean that they didn't want to get a return. They don't want to get a return. But the whole culture then became about invest it because capital's no point sitting in a bank. I need to get it out and doing some work. But then they placed incentives about spending money, not actually about taking the right decisions. Now again, it wasn't wrong when somebody's thinking about how do we move the money out, but the execution of it was breathtaking because they were incentivized to spend. Who cares if I get it back? Who cares if I get a return on it? And that's exactly the same thing with the so-called subprime mortgages. Just get it out, chuck it out, I get my bonus on that. Now, as I said, it really worked for me because they make so many bad investments. I'd be then piling it in the back to try and sort them all out. But again, what you value is really, really, really important. It's really important. You have a voice. You have a voice much, much more than I think perhaps you think individually. There's really, really good people that need to speak out, speak to these types of things to make sure whatever we value, we value the most important things. Which again, I'll bring back to the theme is making sure everybody has the opportunity to realise their potential despite circumstances. Because right now, they don't. And right now, the direction of travel is it's pulling further apart, as I'll show you in a little bit. I'm going to the time. Oh, you're actually going for days. So, uh, <laughs> right. if you want to leave now, you know, <laughs> eight fifteen, you have to go now. Other stuff I've learned along the way, and I'm nowhere near my slides. So, I'll put that back. Um, I'll just leave that up. The other two is the whole concept of failure, which is a completely different seminar. It's a completely different things that we should do because we say one thing and we mean another. We all say we accept failure because it's the best place to learn, but we don't. We don't tolerate failure. As soon as you fail, you've got a bit of judgment attached to you. And by the way, that judgment does not go. And that's why I've known really good people in what I do who genuinely were better than me, but they just dropped the ball. They dropped the ball, but actually, was it their fault? No chance. It was like my Savoy Hotel situation. We managed to save that organisation. So I managed to stay at the press and it took four years to sort that organisation out. 
and find it did come back. But by a matter of a couple of days, it could have been completely reversed. I wouldn't have been standing here today talking to you because that judgment would have attached to me and I would not have been able to get rid of it. So again, concept of failure is a really, really important one as we we were certain contradictions here as I start talking about. So failure for us, failure for me, is actually the only fail when you give up if you think about it. The only fail when you give up, so the only enemy really is tight. And again, that's another key lesson. I'm not going to dwell too much on it because we can do for days you know, on the concept of failure. The next two that I've learned about is actually individually you can start something. So when I say I can start, and the mistakes I made in the first five or six organisations I got involved in probably nearly cost me a breakdown, actually, because it was about me. I said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to drive that, I'm going to do it by strength of will and personality. And again, that's maybe ego speaking, but that's the way it is. You're set up for that. It's all about you're the leader, you need to drive it forward. Absolute disaster. Absolute disaster. Cannot and does not work. It has to be about the collective. As soon as you realise that, you completely come out of your head. Because you know you can start something, but you can sustain nothing. It is then about the we. And as soon as you start to think about the we, you start to think about the team, you start to think about the collective, you start to think about how can I help them understand what needs to be done. And that's why everything's in threes with me. Every single thing is in threes. When I go to an organisation, you have to first look at what's the state of it. How can I then go together a plan that might make a slightly better version of this future? So I need a plan. I need to bring it back to the present. I need to then look at the steps in between the two and make sure that the collective understands that. Again, you'd be amazed, amazed at how many people do not have the three things together. Serious investors, I would even say politicians, country, major, major people have no idea, actually, what the vision for something is. What is the plan for it? But just in the present. Now, if you sit in the present, nothing changes. Because I've got no idea where I'm going. At the end of the day, we've got Brexit right in the middle of this. So there's a bit of a theoretical chat. We've got no idea anyway what's going to happen after the very first of all. Maybe Halloween. Well, Halloween, we should all dress up to the occasion and just see what the first of the was like. In fact, let's just do that, actually. I think it's not going to be the best thing. We'll just forget it first. Um, however, again, amazing. I've sat with some serious people and talked about what do you want this to be? To have a lack of any kind of real plan, vision for it. Then you get the reps. You get people who have got eerie fairy ideas, but absolutely nothing about what's actually going on. And again, that's another way you can interpret the disconnect between policy and practice. Yeah, 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 it should be this, but the reality is it's so far apart. And then the bit in between is the tough part, because that's when you've got to start doing stuff, start changing stuff, start pushing it forward. And again, you can get preoccupied with the process. So if you think about it, each bit has got a bias. What we need to do is keep them together. They need to be together. They need to be like a family. When one's missing, the rest are traumatised. They've got to be permanently together. We need to think, think about this in our whole discourse of public affairs or public sector chat or whatever it may be. They always need to be together, never separate, never separate. I almost force my team to, when we're having dialogue, to, and it's time zones. Come with me, I've got a TARDIS by the way, but come with me in the future. How's it going to look? How's it going to look in the future? Come out in the moment. Because in the process of coming out in the moment, it actually it becomes a little bit less of a bumbling issue. Come out of the moment into the future. How's it going to look? Okay, let's go back into the present. What's the steps in between the two? They need to be joined together. You'd be amazed. That's so simple to say. You'd be amazed at how many people don't have that in mind. The other key thing that I've learned in the private sector, another key thing, is we are magnificent, magnificent about bidding stuff before it's ever come to fruition before it's ever actually had an impact, but magnificent at it. I will explain later on how that is the case. We give nothing the true amount of time required. To change an organisation, at best, for me, my average is just under five years. At best, 
some seven, eight, nine, ten, I think a decade is about something to really affect the change that can take something from failure to success on an international stage at least ten years. So again, let's think about political cycles, let's think of all the cycles we work to, let's think of third sector cycles. How much funding do we give them to go do stuff? Well, it certainly isn't five years. It's more about one or two or three, and then I'll keep you on a very, very tight line. It's not going to change. Nothing's going to happen. So again, for me, consistency is absolutely key. That's why if I bring it back to NCR Pathways, and we just say it's the same thing, time in, time again, and keep it as simple as physically possible. And see it through. Whatever cycle it is, I don't care. Whatever politics, I'm not interested. It's just about those young people being defined by their talent and their, their circumstances. So that was the private sector bit. And again, I'm conscious of time. I'll quickly take you into the one that really defines what I'm doing at the moment, but hopefully you see continuity. It was the care home organisation should never be my business. That's a separate point we could debate with you. Um, but it was. Um, feeling half a million pounds a month it was losing, and there was a lot of issues. If you can imagine, 8 to 18 year olds, but really it was 16 to 18, one off secure. So every abuse of a capital A and a small A was resident in that organisation. I went in as a business person and traumatised, and this is another observation about our systems. What I found as I went through to help sort things out and get the team motivated, we eventually got an organisation that was very effective. It was very effective, according to the adults. So according to the adults, it worked. We had great Ofsted ratings, all English based, nothing in Scotland. Um, its financial performance had gone from half a million a loss a month, a month to about two, three hundred thousand surplus that we invested back in. So great financially, great quality operationally, and actually I could correlate the better it became, the worse it was for the young people. You couldn't make this up actually. If you think about it logically, you go, how on earth could that happen? The facilities were better. It was the staff were more motivated. We'd done all the things, but the system didn't allow it because what happened is we would get really broken people and we'd help sort them out. We'd help them get back engaged in something, back engaged actually in education in this case because what I found through trying everything and failing spectacularly at it, the only thing that shifted the dial was an education outcome. Only thing. Only thing. And that's why as MCL Pathways, that's what it's about. It's an education outcome because it dictates a job choice and that dictates a life chance. That's what it is. Nothing more, nothing less, that's what it is. When you have that equation working, the benefit you then flow and accrue in terms of that young person's belief and confidence in what they are doing then just comes through, gushes out as a subsidiary point to that. But what would happen is we would stabilise young people's behaviours, we'd get them re-engaged, and the system would say, move them. To a lower cost option. Because that's the value. The value we had at the top of the list if I laid them all out and talk to the social workers, it would be, they've got to be the right thing for the young person, they've got to flourish, they've got to, and, and I believe them, but the system then had, what's the most important one? Money. So the most important one is, I need to save, I need to procure, I need to demonstrate best value. In theory, that's a great thing to say. In practice, I've never seen a tender that reflects anything that's relevant to a human being. Nothing. Zero. Just been through one. Couldn't make it up. You really couldn't make it up. But that's what we then get is a system of contradictions. But why there's some really good people in those systems, fabulous people in those systems. But it drives behaviours. So I got possessed by this, and sorry for using that sort of dark language here, I got absolutely <laughs> driven by this. So how on earth can you get that? You know, really motivated me. How on earth could you get such an adult view of life that, that actually is counter to the young person. <coughs> so, the rest I guess in terms of track record, you know, but I'm going to move on a little bit more quickly, is we started a journey. It's been 12 years, um, so it's not a five minute job, it's been 12 years, and as I said, I can tell you what doesn't work. And I can tell you thousands of things that don't work. But now I think I can tell you what does work, and I think I 
and share with you what I think applies not just to what we do, but applies to any other system. Because I think we are arriving at a formula, and I will share this in, in more sort of through debate and discussion, a formula I think that can transform the public sector. I really do. Because we're seeing it. Early days, but we're seeing it. So what is it? How can we then bridge a bit of effective practice? Because we've gone from one school, rejection, to one school, to five schools, to ten, most importantly now we're right up at supporting 2,000 young people each week with what we know works, what we know transforms, as I'll share with you. So again, we're just at that pivoting point, and I'm looking at individually here because you could really contribute to this, but we're just at the pivoting point where we can take a very high impacting bit of practice and make it policy. It's a very rickety bridge. I love that image because that image sums up magnificently. A few of us could fall down between the cracks. You know, I'm hoping that's not going to be the case. But it is, you know, how can we rotate between the two? Now, what I'm going to share with you is the simplicity of NCR pathways in the young people's voice. Because what I've just talked is systems, words, theory. I'm just going to share with you a little bit of actually what is it? Because it's the most breathtakingly simple thing that transforms. It's called care. It's called time. It's called listening. And it's called something that our young people don't get, particularly those that are disadvantaged through no fault of their own. How does it manifest itself? We'll leave you some numbers to think about. That is what young people get on average. Well, I've just picked out three measures. I've picked out three measures of staying on. So beyond 16, because you know that you're in Scotland, you can leave at 16. So there's about 79% of all young people stay on beyond 16. But in order to get qualifications, you really need to be in fifth and sixth year. Qualifications then, and that's just taking one attainment measure, national five, at least one subject. So again, good news, 92% of all our young people are getting that. And again, a key one in terms of outside lane is what is the progression after school. And we just measure, that's a measurement for college, university, or employment. So you're going to stuff that, that could sustain. Now the killer is that is what our most disadvantaged young people get. Mm. Nothing. They're in exactly the same school. So this is not about teaching. And I articulate it in a very, very simple way. If I have personal problems, of which I have a few, <coughs> as I'm sure we all do, then it affects my ability to concentrate as another. You can't really concentrate. It just gnaws away in your head. So you can't concentrate. Can I take personal problems and put them into a young person's mind then? Put them into a young person's mind. How on earth can we expect them to concentrate in class? They can't. But what happens is they go immediately they possibly can. So the vast majority. That 39, in my experience, is overstated. I think the number is 22 when I strip in and add on those that actually are affected. So the vast majority are going. They're going without much of any qualifications and they're ending up not going to college, university or employment. So completely unsurprisingly, whether I like or not, it's just a fact that the education system is linear and it's paced. So you have to go at pace and it is. And I, that's, I, love, that, I love the track as the analogy because there is a finishing line. And that finishing line is when you are judged. And you are judged when you leave school. And that judgment attaches to you. What did you get? Employers look at it and they judge it. So actually, if they don't achieve in a time scale by given, with the race of the last to run, that affects a lifetime. It's not actually just affects them at that age. It affects a lifetime. There's some young people through good fortune and through resilience themselves, might get a chance to run back round the track and a chance later in life to get through that education. But education really does dictate 
job choices and life chances to an amazing extent. That's what our system produces at the moment. Good news, because that is good news, is that we can change it. And we can change it to that. That's our three-year results averaged for NCR pathways. Now, we've not caught yet. We're going to catch up. Because that's, that's the desire. Our desire is very straightforward. We want the quality of education that comes job choices and life chances. Now, that might seem off the scale, and it is, but if I bring it back to what actually is the core of this, are we teaching? No. Are we actually giving any education? No. Maybe a little bit of life skills? It really is just care injected into the system, not outside the system, but injected absolutely into the system. <coughs> I might then describe a little bit before this would work. Oh, no, I've come back. I've lost a little bit of audio, I've come back. Um, what the young people say that it is, is just that somebody cares. Just that somebody spends the time. And what we do in each of the schools, just so I can elaborate on it, and then I'll come back to how we can collectively change the system is we have a member of staff in the school, that member of staff does three things. That member of staff will help identify the young people when they come up from primary school, which is quite a sensitive time. They then deliver group work in first and second year, good fun stuff, get engaged in the school, start to look at what could that best version of you be. They then get matched with a mentor in S3, and that mentor is pure and simply there to listen and to build a relationship with that young person. No skill required, none whatsoever. Only that you care. And that period a week for a year, ideally two, is what they underpins that young person. And it really is partly being a simple parent, but also being an encourager. And being a mentor, we put the word mentor against it. But it's not what the adult thinks a mentor is. It's not that you have to have solutions or that you need to know the education system, or that you need to actually come up with some idea that's so inspired that it transforms their life. It's actually got nothing to do with the mentor in that sense. Because if you think about 13, 14 year old, I mean if you've had or brought up 13 or 14 year olds, the listening skills themselves tend to be a little bit challenged. So whatever you say, they might not hear it anyway. It's completely counterintuitive. It's the ability for them to express how they feel, to think that they've got someone. I mean, this is how breathtaking it is. To think that they've got someone who's coming for them and only them. I'm blown away with how simple this is, with how effective it is. And examples, and it's not just odd stories. You can see it translates into some big, big numbers. It's not just odd stories. So my mentee has gone from a homeless unit to medical school. You couldn't make it up. I mean, seriously, you could not make it up. Now, what did I do? What I thought I did was definitely not what she told me she heard. <laughs> no question. I mean, I have, because I've since deep, gone through this deep before the, what was it? What was it? Because I, I've done it for years and I've been to do it. And I'm like, what really made the moment? Do you know where the moment was? That I kept turning up. She had no family. Absolutely no family. A strange, so I forget most of her. Had nothing. Absolutely nothing. Other than a phenomenal amount of time and resilience to stick out of. Studying in a homeless unit, by the way, is not something you really want to ask anybody to do. She made the choice because it was the most stable place to be. Couldn't make up. Absolutely could not make up. And we have hundreds of those examples. And purely because I gave 50 minutes a week, and we couldn't make it up 50 minutes a week just to be with her. And then it did become little moments of, no, you can, because she had doubt. She didn't think she could. And you go, no, you absolutely can't get to say, you're doing this, my goodness, you can do that. So you do then need to do a little bit of how can I really encourage 
but to, to keep focused on that best version of fact because she knows she regrets. And that's what NCR stands for, just to share a little bit about that. NCR stands for three words. It's our values. What we want to motivate the young people in the first instance, but we all know motivation does not last. We all know that does not last in an adult, far less a young person. You need commitment then. You need commitment to that best version of you, and that's what the encouragement is. And then the resilience, never to give up. That's our virtual mentoring. That's all we ask our mentors to do, is find that motivation in that young person, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is, it could be anything. Find that motivation, get them thinking about the best version of themselves, and then really build that resilience to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And that's the currency. Now, I'm going to finish in about 10 minutes, because I'm conscious Joe's going to give me a hard time. How can we then, and this is a bit of a call out to change the system, how can we actually change the system? Because I think we are at a brilliant point with NCR values that we could potentially really affect the system. Because that's the only basis that I'm going to do it. The only basis that I'm going to do it. And that's speaking from failure. Because the very first organisations I went into, sure, I changed them. But again, if I'm being really, really direct, when I left, it fell back. And you go, what's the point in that then? What is the point in doing something if it's all about you? There's no point. Absolutely no point. And that pained me to this day of some of the stuff that I've been involved in, that I took credit for, that I took reward for, but it fell back. Because you were doing it on your strength of world personality, not on the how can. So for me, sustaining is what I start off with. How can this sustain? Well, the only way NCR Pathways is ever going to sustain is what I'm about to take you through, is if the system owns it. System feels the owner, actually owns it, is proud of it, drives it, and drives it way beyond me. Because then a big test I have to my professional colleagues in previous life is I'm going to judge our success two years after we've gone. Because that is really, really, really difficult. That's really difficult. Because that then we've created something that actually has got momentum. And I think we've got the opportunity to set up it. So, my story of how do you turn the tank up, how do you actually then address the public sector? Well, did I, with the stories I've shared, the stats and the stories, and also to be fair, we did bring in, I did bring additional funding and finance, do you think that was enough to float the tank up, to get it moving, to get it turned? No, it's not. Even the stories I could share, the emotional stuff I could bring, I will and I'll send you video links or whatever to, to get a sense of it. It's not enough. Now, why is it not enough? Again, because of a whole different seminar, if you like, I'm going to spend a huge amount of time on this, other than to say you'll recognise some of the things of systems. And again, best way to describe when somebody comes up with a new idea for a new company, let's take a building, let's take this building as an example. What do you need? Well, you need the person that visions it, you know, imagines it, wants to build it, the entrepreneur. So that's one type of person. You need the architect then who's going to take those ideas and translate it into something that a builder can then build and clearly you then get somebody to operate it. That's four distinct types of people in my experience, resident round the world. Doesn't mean you've all got preference. I'm not sure maybe you're positioning yourselves into where do I sit in that equation. I don't think there's anyone for it. I think there really is for it. I said, you all have a preference, doesn't mean that you can't do two, doesn't mean you can't do three, doesn't mean you can't do all four. But you've got a preference. What happens to a system, any system, not just public sector, is that you do the job and you start to go. Because it's done the job. So diversity goes. And you get a lot of lookalikes who run stuff. And for those operators, those operational animals in the room, you die for a rule book. You need it. You need a process, you need a rule book. And what happens is the whole process of change just grinds to a gentle halt. In the public sector, you then add on the dynamic of politics and perceptions. And my goodness, see if I ever do write a book, I will never be let in Scotland ever again. <laughs> because I have got some absolutely fabulous examples. Despite the stats and the stories, despite. Politics. And again, I understand and appreciate it because this is human nature. There's another thing I actually want to call out to any system. Let's just accept human nature. I accept it, so let's accept it. And if a politician's values go back to, because I've met them all, I've met them all, 
And finally, they all out the table again, what do they value? Well, they do want to do stuff. They do want to change stuff. They do want to have an impact. But they all out the table, yeah. Again, let's not like that. What's the very top one they have? I want to be re-elected. <laughs> okay. What behavior do you think that going to, that's going to drive? That's going to drive, I want to be re-elected. So I need to start spinning. I need to start perceptions. I need to start stuff that pulls policy away from practice again. So you've got under the surface, under the water, this was a killer for me. Because I thought, we've got the funding. We've got the stats, the stories. Surely I can get the tanker turned around. No. Good news is, we are. And we are because we've been able to not, and I'll finish just elaborating a little bit on this, not get rid of human nature because you wouldn't. We can't chuck out the system. This is the thing where people say radical reform. And I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, what does that mean? But like, chuck it out, we'll start again. It's like, no. You yeah, chuck it, but you want to kill it, because that's really what we're talking about. Human nature is not going to go away. Human nature is there. We've got a system of democracy, if you like, as we want to introduce dictatorships again. We've got a system of democracy, we're going to drive that behaviour, we're going to have people that value things in different ways. That's just the way it is. How can we reduce the impact of it is the way in which we're working. And there's three things that MCR Pathways is trying. And it's ridiculous to sound, but it's three things, and you can say two of them have got nothing to do with the young people. But clearly the stats and stories are why I do it, and that's what we want. That's the first thing. It's not enough. Second thing is what I call purposeful partnership. And I'm going to call out the word partnership here. And your philosophical society, you'll get this. There is no such thing, in my opinion, in my experience, and I can be shot down for this, there is no such thing as a permanent partnership. No such thing. And I'm talking the corporate because clearly I don't want to make any managers. <laughs> <laughs> there is no such thing. Everything has a moment in time, and everything has a purpose. And unless you call it out, because I've seen partners coming together, and yes, it's all great and all good, and it lasts for a period of time, and then things start to conflict. Why do they conflict? Because you've got two different objectives. Now, what we have with Glasgow City Council, and what we now have with seven other councils, and by December we'll have with 12, is a purposeful partnership. And the partnership is, we're going to give you this. We're going to show you how, but we're going to get to you. I don't want to exist, so we're not going to show you how to do it. We're going to give you the tools. We're going to transfer the knowledge that we've built up over 12 years. We're going to transfer the skills, and then most importantly, the confidence to be able to do this. And with Glasgow, if I tell you right now, quietly, that's what we've got. So Glasgow employ the people in the school, despite austerity, on full-time permanent contracts. They manage them. We have control of the process and the quality and the integrity, because the key thing is integrity has to pass with that. This model has got to remain, because it's the model that works. So again, it's a purposeful punch. It's a very, very, very difficult thing to do. But we're from really good leaders, and you need to get a leader. So I'm Mary O'Donnell, and to give her huge credit, is, is our, in Glasgow, chief executive. She is an MCR mentor. She's not doing that for accolades, she's not doing that for re-election, for reappointment. she's doing that because it's the right thing to do. And she's absolutely as passionate about this as possible, but she knows she's going to get it. She already has it. The other aspect then is we need to be able to give everybody a benefit, not just the young people. And again, with MCR Pathways, we need to invest quite a lot of time and effort to look at what's the benefit to the mentor, the mentor's organisation, can we sell that hard to organisations, and again I'll show data later on once we go for a break, of how we can now really evidence that the mentors get a lot, the organisations get a lot, and actually this is everybody benefits. As soon as somebody doesn't benefit, you know it's going to get undermined at some point in time because human nature gets in. So I guess for system change, or very short on this, just to, to stimulate a little bit of, of your thinking, my experience to date really is summed up by you know, nothing is worth doing unless you can sustain the change. Nothing is worth doing. Sustaining the change is then about the collective, not about the individual. What I'm doing now matters, really, really matters. Go back to that track. 
Our track right now is chucking people off it with nothing. Because the track is the track. When we do this, we can get them close to equality. Most importantly, as I'm seeing, so I'll give you another story, one of our first mentees, four years behind, Frank Graham in the audience knows him, four years behind in his education, we had probably 13 different home moves before he even got to secondary, can you imagine the instability? Addiction issues in the family, all sorts of stuff, again, he shares that and let's share these things openly. But if I bring him right today, He's been to college, been to university, got his graduate job, just got married, bought a house, he's way ahead of me at his age, and he's back as a mentor. You could not be that up. And he's taken his family through that process. Now that's what gives me hope for, actually, this is not just about one-offs. This is a generational shift that we could see if we do it at scale. So again, Key thing, can this anchor change? I think it can with the stats and the stories. I'm pretty certain once we get to 10,000 of those young people, we'll make sure that it does. But there's process that we can fill in to make this happen. Now, I have got, by the way, I'm serious, I've got another 25 slides, but I'm even going to attempt to review them because I think you guys definitely need a great job. I feel Joe going to chuck this off at me just like, why can't we? Well, I'll come back to any, any questions that, that we have. Thank you.